My name is Lee Stimkowski, and this is a tutorial and introduction to the Unity game engine. In this tutorial, we assume you have absolutely no background, you've never used it before, and by the end, we'll have created a game called Starfish Collector. This is a simple game where the player controls a turtle who moves around the screen and whose goal is to collect all the starfish on the screen. We'll cover topics such as importing textures, creating materials, and applying them to models. We'll talk about basic physics and setting up collision meshes. And as some optional added polish at the end of the game, we'll talk about adding a user interface, just text-based. We'll create a skybox, and we'll add some audio to our game. Alright, before we begin, first we need some assets to use in this game. Fortunately, the internet is great for finding what we're going to need. We won't need very many things. We'll need an image of ocean water. The easiest way to get this is to do a Google image search for a seamless texture. So go on over to images.google.com and do a search for seamless water texture, for instance. And any one of these is going to be fine. We'll also need some models for our game as well. These are three-dimensional objects which we can control and move in our game. My favorite place to go for this is a website called modelsresource.com. At this website, you can download models from various games for consoles and PC. You can't use any of these in your final projects. Think of them as using them for testing purposes only. And I'd rather not use a default system font. I'd like to use some fancy fonts. There's a great website for this as well called dafont.com. If you head on over to this website, you'll see lots of royalty-free fonts which you can use and download. So feel free to get a font as well. When you're looking for models, we'll need two models for this game. We'll need an object that will represent the player. I'm just using a turtle object and some object which is collectible. I'm using starfish, but there's nothing special about those two choices. Your player could be a mouse collecting pieces of cheese, for instance. So go ahead, download any pair of object files you want, one player and one item to collect. Once you have all of those assets ready to go, I place them on my desktop for easy access, go ahead and start up Unity. We're gonna, I'm using Unity 5.3, but you'll usually want to stay updated to the latest version. I'm also using Microsoft Visual Studio for editing code. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start up a new project. I'll call this project Starfish Collector. By default, it's set to be a 3D project, so I'll go ahead and create that. You can always toggle between 2D and 3D later on if you like. And here is the Unity window. It can be a little bit intimidating when you first use it, but I'll give you a tour of some of the main areas. Um, first, this window in the center. This is your scene. This is where you lay out the different objects in your game. It lets you design the game world. On the left is the hierarchy panel, and in this panel is a list of all the objects which are currently in your game. If you click on one, it will highlight the object in the editor. If you double click, it will center it on the screen. And that can be very useful. When an object is selected in your game, on the right hand side is the inspector panel. And this will tell you everything about the properties for the object which you've selected. For instance, the transform tells you the position or location of your object, how it's rotated along each of the coordinate axes, and how it's scaled. We'll be using this a lot. Finally, down at the bottom, is the Assets panel. This is a list of any object that you've imported into your game. It's not necessarily the list of objects currently in your scene, but anything which is available for use. Alright, let's go ahead and let's start off by importing some of our assets. So I'm going to go ahead and take this window, slide it to the side a little bit. The assets I'm going to use, let's see, I've got a water texture, that's an image, I can just click and drag this down into my Assets panel. And voila, it imports. I also want to click and drag my model of the star, the collectible object. 
and the texture which will be applied to it. The same thing for my turtle. I'm going to drag in the OBJ file, the object, and the texture which will be applied to it. And finally, I'm going to drag in my font for use later on. And there's some other objects which I'll download and import as I need them. All right. First, I want to add kind of a ground which represents the ocean floor. To do that, I'm going to right-click in the Hierarchy panel, go down to 3D Object, and create a cube. Let's see, so here's my cube. Notice that cube appears in this list. One thing we do not want is we don't want the cube attached to anything. For instance, depending on what was selected over here in the Hierarchy panel, your display might look more like this where cube is indented underneath another object. That means it's attached, so if you see something like this, just click and drag the cube into its own position in the list. I also want to rename this. It's not just any old cube, it's going to serve as my ocean floor. So I will rename it as Ocean. Now down in the Properties panel, I've got all these different values which I can change. I'd like to center my cube at the origin, so I'm going to change the position to 0, 0, 0. And I'd like it to be a wide cube, so I'd like to stretch it out in the x and z directions. y is up, so I can leave that alone. But x and z, I want to make that nice and large, so maybe I'll make that 100 by 100 for x and z. Right now it doesn't look like much of anything, it just looks like a flat cube. So I'd like to create a material and apply that to the cube next. So I'm going to go ahead and right-click in the Assets panel. So as a side note, where you right-click, you'll get different menus. For instance, if I right-click in Hierarchy, I get one set of options. If I right-click in Assets, I get a different set. So go ahead, right-click in the Assets panel. I'm going to create a material. I'm going to name that material mat underscore water. All right, now I'd like to use an image. I'd like this to be a texture-based material. You could set it to a solid color if you wanted by clicking on this area right here. I could set it to be some kind of a blue color. That would be cool. But what I'm really interested in is using this image. So to apply this image, I'm going to click on the texture and drag it up to this little square next to albedo. It's like a diffuse color setting. And then you'll notice it renders on this object sphere. To apply it to this cube, I now drag the material on top of the cube. That's looking pretty good. Now this particular image I selected because I can repeat the image and it lines up with itself nicely. It's called a seamless texture. To get it to repeat, Underneath the material, I'm going to take a look at the first line where it says tiling. It says tiling twice, but I'm interested in the first one. I'm going to change this to 10 by 10. Right, then we get a very fine resolution for this object. All right, that's looking pretty good so far. And by the way, if you'd like to navigate around in your scene, you can use the different mouse buttons to move in different ways. The left mouse button selects objects. If you want to move around in your scene, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out of whatever is the center focal point. I can click down the left mouse button and slide around to pan my view of the scene. If I click the right mouse button, that will go ahead and rotate around the center. In addition, there are some nice shortcuts to getting different views of a scene. For instance, if you'd like a view from the top, this little widget in the top right-hand corner of the scene area, if you click on these different cones extruding from the cube, it'll immediately switch your perspective to looking around that coordinate axis. So this is looking down from the y-axis. This is looking straight on from the z-axis, which looks kind of strange. So I'd probably want to pan up. Look from the x position different good views of your scene. All right, next I'd like to go ahead and add some other objects to my scene. I've already imported the turtle model. I'm going to go ahead and click and drag this into my scene. I'd like to apply this texture to it. So once again I'm going to create a material. 
It's kind of like an intermediary between the texture and the model. Go ahead and right click in the Assets panel. I'm going to create a new material. I will call this Matt underscore Turtle. And just as before, I'll click and drag the texture next to where it says Albedo. And then I see the texture applied to this sphere. I'll now drag this, whoop, not onto the box, but onto the turtle. All right, that looks pretty good. You might notice the turtle is a little bit shiny. You can change that by adjusting the values in the turtle material. For instance, by changing the metallic setting or changing the smoothness setting. You can get rid of that glare if you like. So feel free to experiment with the settings. All right, that turtle's looking pretty good. I'd like to do a few more things to this turtle as well. For instance, um, the turtle object, I'm going to create something called a prefab. That just enables me to duplicate the object more easily later. You might notice down here in the assets panel, the turtle model and the turtle material, they're kind of separate. If I go ahead and click on turtle model and drag it from the hierarchy panel down to the assets panel, that creates something called a prefab which is, enables me to create more instances of an object if I need it. I'm going to go ahead and rename that to Turtle. And notice the image of the turtle. You can see it's got the material applied. It looks very nice. Now this turtle, I'd like it to interact in a physics-y way. I'd like it to be affected by gravity. I'd like it to collide with other objects. So what I need to do is click on Turtle. I'm going to add a component. So go over to the Inspector tab for the turtle and add a physics component called Rigid Body. Right, and that's going to give it some basic physics-like behaviors. All right, so at this point, we should probably save our game, too. Before we do that, we also want to save the scene, which gives us the different locations of the objects that we've added. So let's go up to the File menu. I'd like to select Save Scene. Let's call this main, so it's the main scene. I'll go ahead and save the project. Pressing the play button will show me what the scene looks like. Whoop, and there goes my turtle. Just flew right through the bottom there. That's because we have not yet set a collision polygon. We'll do that in just a moment. All right. So let's go ahead and click on turtle. And Turtle, you might notice there's a subheading underneath Turtle in the Hierarchy panel. That says Default. That's actually your mesh, the geometric data. In fact, if you click on it, it's hard to see, but you can see the triangular lines that make up the basic faces or polygon sides of the Turtle. So when this is selected, in the Inspector panel, you'll see things such as Mesh Renderer and the material which is being applied. I'd like to add another component. This component is also under Physics. I want to add something called a Mesh Collider. There's lots of different ways you can say what the boundary of an object is, but Mesh Collider is the one we're most interested in. And I'd like to click the box next to Convex. Just to simplify computation, we'll assume that the turtle is a convex shape. This speeds up rendering a lot. And once that box is checked, you'll notice there's a bunch of lines right around it. That'll be the shape of the turtle for the purposes of physics simulations. Once that's set up, if I go ahead and hit play, right, you'll notice your turtle actually falls on the ground. I also like to change the position of the turtle a little bit. To do this, the easiest way to get it set up is to do a top-down perspective. So back in the main scene area. I'm going to click on the Y cone so I get a top view. Then I'll double click on main camera and so I'll get a picture of the camera's point of view. Remember, double clicking the hierarchy centers it on a given object. In fact, when the main camera is selected, you'll see a preview of what the camera can see. I'll zoom out a little bit. I'll pan the image down. I'll click on my turtle. There's lots of different tools for moving it around. I'm going to go ahead and click on it, and by default, these little arrows appear. If they aren't appearing, make sure this crosshair arrows is selected up in the top left corner. That allows you to translate your object. In fact, oh, if you're not careful, you might go up or down. So I like to use the coordinate axes here.
You can also spin and scale an object if you want using this set of controls. So for example I could click the rotate button. I could spin the turtle around so he's facing a different direction. I could also scale the turtle but I'm pretty happy with the default turtle size. Alright, turtle's a little bit high. That's okay, he'll fall down. Okay, next I want to add some star-like objects to this as well, the items which the turtle is going to collect in the game. All right, so in order to do that, we know what to do. I'm going to go ahead and click on the star model object and click and drag that into the scene. And you'll notice the proportions of the star are a little bit off. That's okay though, that's easy to fix. I'm going to change the position so it's centered at the origin. So the position I'll set to 0, 0, 0. The scale, I'd like this to be a whole lot smaller. So maybe I'll set this to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. And that's about the right size as compared with the turtle. I probably want to rotate it too so it's kind of sitting flat on the ocean floor. So I want to rotate it around the x-axis, that's that red arrow. I want to rotate it, say, 90 degrees. So now it looks like it's lying flat. Excellent. I'd like to apply the material next. I need to create a material using this texture. So go ahead and right-click and create a new material. I'll call it Material Star. I'll apply the star texture to the box next to Albedo and then drag the material top of the star. That looks pretty good. Happy with that. All right. Uh, a few more things I want to do next. Um, one final change I need to make to the star object. And it's not obvious why we need to do this now. This will be important later when we start doing some coding. For the star model, I want to give it a tag. I want to associate kind of a textual information to the star so that I can easily identify it later in code. In order to do that, click on star model and then in the inspector panel where it says tag, it's currently untagged, go ahead and click that and you'll get a drop down menu. I'd like to add a new tag. So select that. Uh, the list of user defined tags is empty. Let's go ahead and click on that plus icon. I'm going to type as a new tag star and hit enter. I'll click on my star model again. That didn't actually add the tag, it just added the tag to the list. It didn't add the tag to the model. So click on the star model once more, where it says tag. Click in the drop-down list and now you'll see star in that list. Great, so now this particular model is tagged as a quote star. I'd like to create a prefab because I need lots of stars to collect in the Starfish Collector game. So I'm going to go ahead and click and drag star model down to the assets panel. I'll rename this just regular old star. And now, this is the beauty of prefabs, I can just drag this star from the assets panel to make new stars all throughout my game. This is great so I don't have to keep reapplying the material. And so maybe I'll have a bunch of stars right there. So now I've got a few stars. Um, some other things that I should do, I should apply some physics type behaviors to the star objects as well. So I should have done this before I created the other stars, but there's an easy way to apply a change to all star objects at the same time. If I click on star down in the assets panel, I'll get the original star object, and every other star in this game is a duplicate of this prefab object. If I make any changes to the prefab object, those changes will apply to every one of these stars. So, clicking on star, first I'm going to add a component to star. Um, just as with the turtle, this is going to be a physics component, a rigid body behavior. And then the collision polygon gets added at the mesh level. So, in my star, I'm going to go to the default part of the star. This is where you'll see the mesh renderer. This has mesh data. I'm going to add a component, a physics component, a mesh collider, and once again click on the convex box. 
and now if I click on my star you know it's working when you see kind of a green pentagon around the star shape. That's going to be the collision mesh that it uses to check for collisions. Right, we should go ahead and save once more, save the project, and then press play to test it and see how it looks. Right, you've got a turtle, you've got some starfish. Hey, that's looking pretty good. I might take a moment to adjust my camera too so I get a better view on this scene. If I go ahead and click on the main camera, and maybe I'll get a side view, I'd like to move the camera up a little bit, like so. Move the camera up, maybe move the camera back. And I'd like to tilt the camera down. So I'll click on the rotation arrows and just spin it so it's looking down a little bit. And this will give me a better perspective on the scene. Let's try hitting play again. Yep, that looks a little bit cooler. All right, we'll go with that. All right, so far everything's looking good. Um, there's no interactivity yet. We need to add some code to get that working. But right now, the scene is looking relatively good. Our assets menu is looking like a little bit of a mess because we have so many assets and we're just going to add more later. So now might be a good time to organize things into folders. There's one folder which is added by default. It's called the materials folder. It contains that default grayish material. I'm going to go ahead and drag my materials into this folder. And I'm going to create a few more folders as well. I'm going to right click and create a folder. This folder is going to be called textures. So I'm going to put all these different images. So the star texture, turtle texture, the water texture. I don't really need those right now. Alright, and I'll make another folder for models as well. So create a folder. Call this models. I'll put my star model and my turtle model in there. I'll leave my prefabs out here because these are the objects I might go ahead and clone some more later on. And I'll leave the font out here too. Later on I'll make a fonts folder, but I'll leave it here for easy access at the moment. Alright, the next step is to add some code. And we want this game to be interactive and do something. And again, I've set up a Visual Studio ahead of time. Some of you might be using Monodevelop, that's fine too. But either way, I'm going to go to the Assets panel, right-click, and I'm going to create a C-sharp script. I'm going to call this script Turtle Controller. Turtle Controller. And notice I'm using no space at all. Right, so this file is going to be named turtlecontroller.cs for a C-sharp. If you click on it, you kind of see the default code which is created for you. I'm going to go ahead and double-click. It's going to start up Visual Studio, or whatever your file extension is. All right, and here's my default code. Notice that the name of this class, it has to match the name of the file. Visual Studio does this automatically for you. Um, if this, for some reason, looks different than the name of your file, you want to change it. All right, so Turtle Controller, it extends the Mono Behavior class. I'm going to add a little bit of code. Uh, not a lot of fancy things to begin with. First, I just want to add some code to verify that everything's working. There's two default methods which are included. One of them is the start method. This runs once. And the update method runs once per frame. So, usually a game running at 60 frames per second, this will run 60 times per frame. I'd like to add a line of code into the start method. This is going to be some simple code. I'm just going to say print this is kind of a tradition in computer science. Hello, world! Then a semicolon. And so this will print the message, hello, world. I'll save this. All right, so once you've entered in this line of code, I'm going to go ahead and minimize and head back to Unity. I've got a script, but the script does not run unless I assign it to an object in the game. Eventually, I'm going to use this script to move the turtle around. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and attach this script to the turtle. The way you do that is by clicking and dragging. So I'm going to click and drag the turtle controller script to the turtle. You can verify this has worked correctly by clicking on turtle in your hierarchy. And over in the inspector panel, you'll notice that now there's something for turtle controller script. To test if this works, and go ahead and press play. 
you might be wondering where do these words appear by default text is printed to the console to see that um, right above the assets panel there's a tab which says console if you click on that you should see the words hello world which is run by the print method all right um, another fun thing you can do while the game is playing notice there's a button that says maximize on play I'm gonna go ahead and click that so now when I play it actually fills up the whole screen which is kind of cool and also the console messages will be printed right down here at the bottom alright so we've got a script um, that doesn't do anything very interesting and using the console window really isn't how you communicate with your players I just attached that so we could verify that our code is working I'd like to go ahead and add some keyboard based movement now so I'm gonna go back to my turtle controller script and I'm gonna do this in a couple of ways first I'm gonna add some variables which will control the movement speed of my turtle both the uh, moving forward and the rotational speed all right, so first I'm going to add some public variables right here. Uh, two floating point numbers. First, move speed. Set that to 1.0F. And public float turn speed. Also set that to 1.0F. And I might want to adjust these values later. Making these values public variables makes them very easy to adjust actually from inside Unity. Right, so I've got some public variables defined. Now I'm going to go down to the update method. I'm going to add a couple of lines of code. This is going to be very simple keyboard-based input. I'm going to check to see which keys are being pressed. So the code I require is if input.getKey. This is going to check to see if a key is currently being held down. So this is good for continuous style input like movement. And then this requires an argument, key code dot up arrow. So this is going to check to see if the up arrow is being pressed. If so, I'd like to change the position of the object. So I'm going to say this dot transform dot position. So this refers to the object, the game object to which this is attached. Transform, you, re you might remember that's the small box at the top of the inspector which lists all sorts of information like scaling, rotation, and position. So what I'd like to set this equal to is, let's see, it's going to be equal to this.transform.position. So it's going to be equal to the original position plus I want to add some displacement in the forward direction and there's a class which stores the default forward vector called vector 3 dot forward but I'd like to scale this by whatever my movement speed is so I'm going to multiply it by move speed however there's a slight problem with this which we won't see right away but we'll fix it ahead of time after the turtle turns it's going to have a different forward vector Right, vector 3 dot forward you can think of that as kind of a global forward direction we want the turtle to move forward with respect to its local rotation around whatever axes it's been rotated so I actually need to multiply this vector by its rotation data so I'm gonna say this dot transform dot local rotation so I need to do this extra thing in order to get the rotation vector to look correct. And of course there's shorter ways to write this set of code. Visual Studio is trying to help me by saying you don't need this and I could actually use plus equals here. The vector class is great. It supports operator overloading. But this will work. This will be sufficient for our purposes right now. So if the user is holding down up arrow key the position should be incremented by whatever its current rotation is times the move speed let's go ahead and save this and head back to unity and play the game all right if I press the up arrow notice he moves he actually moves pretty fast in fact he flies off the screen relatively fast 
That's okay though. If I click on the turtle object in the hierarchy, notice in the inspector panel, the turtle controller script, all those public variables will be listed right here. So if the move speed is too fast, I could adjust that. Maybe I'll change that to 0 0.1. It's really convenient, so you don't have to go back into the original code. Now if I press play again, and press the up arrow key, that's a little bit better. And there he goes. See you later, turtle. We'd like the turtle to rotate next, so we add a few more lines of code. Going back to the turtle controller class, I'm going to add a new if statement. This is going to be if. Again, I'm going to check to see if a key is currently being pressed. So get key. Uh, this is key code dot. We'll do the left arrow first. In this case, we're changing the local rotation of the turtle. This dot transform dot local rotation is equal to. Let's see, I've got to somehow change the rotation. And so the way we do this, just like position is stored in a class called Vector3, rotation style information is stored in a class called Quaternion. So Quaternion.Euler, 0, comma, negative turn speed, comma, 0. All right, so this will rotate around the y-axis. Remember, y-axis points up and down, so rotating around that axis will turn left and right. So I'm going to rotate by this amount. So this transform rotation. And the other interesting thing about rotations is they're multiplied rather than added. To change the position, I added something to the original position. To change the rotation, I'm multiplying the original rotation. So this dot transform dot local rotation. And I might as well add in the right arrow turning as well. It looks very similar to this block of code, so I can go ahead and copy paste it. I just need to make a few changes. Change left arrow to right arrow. And the turn speed is positive, turning to the right. All right, let's go ahead and save those changes. Here they are. If you want, this is a video, so you can go ahead and pause it if you like to take the time to get this code in. Save and go ahead back to Unity. And let's try this out. So now, pressing left and right turns my turtle to the left and the right. And if I press forward, my turtle moves in that direction. Hooray! Now we can climb over starfish. What fun! And notice the position, the forward vector is changing depending on the current local rotation of the turtle. That's super important. All right, we've got a moving turtle. That's pretty cool. What would be even cooler is if the turtle could collect starfish. So we'll add some code for that next. Part of the tricky part of working with Unity is sometimes figuring out what is the method that does what I want to do? So in order to process collisions, there's kind of a default method in Unity which would check for collisions. So I'm going to go down here after the update method and write another method. This method is called uh, void return type, doesn't return anything. On collision enter takes as a parameter a collision object stores collision-related data. It's important to get this method signature perfect. The spelling counts, capitalization counts. It starts with an capital O. Collision, that matters a lot. Uh, the name of the variable doesn't matter, though. But the method name, the parameter input type, definitely matter. All right. This is also where that tagging of the star object will come in useful. So. I'm going to do an if statement. Whenever the turtle collides with an object, as reported by the rigid body behavior, this method will be activated on collision enter. So I'm going to check to see what I collided with. 
right? So the collision object, it stores any game objects involved in the collision, and I'm going to check what kind it is by checking its tag. I'm going to check to see if the tag is star. It's a way of distinguishing the different types of objects. And if that's true, there's a method called destroy. I can just destroy that object. So call dot game object. All right, that's it for now. Let's go ahead and save and see if that turtle can collect those starfish. Going back to Unity. And hit play. What happens when I touch the starfish? Poof, it disappears. My turtle is now a real starfish collector. Now, unfortunately, there's really no feedback. It's, okay, did I get all the starfish? I think so. Did I? No? Yes? Maybe? Uh, what I really need now is some kind of a user interface, right? I need to maybe tell the user how they're doing, you know, maybe how many starfish are left. I'd like some kind of a message, like a you win style message, once I've collected all of them. So, to do that, there's a couple of things we're going to set up. Um, we're going to add some text objects to the game next. In order to do that, I'm going to go back to the hierarchy. I'm going to right click and create some objects. This is underneath the UI object, or the UI menu. Go ahead and select text object. This will create a text object. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on text. I'm going to change this to maybe score text. So I'm going to use this to display the score. And if I double click on the text, actually it zooms out and shows me what it looks like. It's very strange because the text is almost in a it's in a different world. Right? It's like an overlay that gets put on top of the screen. Right? These letters aren't going to necessarily float over off to the side of the game world. That's okay. Um, first, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'd like to change some of the settings on Canvas. The Canvas is what contains all the textual elements. Um, click on Canvas, and under Render Mode, see how it says a uh, screen space overlay? That's fine. Uh, UI Scale Mode. I'd like it to scale with the screen size. All right. In fact, if I double click on the Canvas, I can kind of see what that looks like. Uh, the text is really <laughs> rather small. If I were to say hit play right now, you just see a little bit of small text down here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, change the size of this and change the font too while I'm at it. So with the text object selected, um, see how there's a, it says font Arial? This font file that I imported earlier, I can go ahead and click and drag it right on top there. Get a much cooler font. I'd like to go ahead and make this label a lot bigger as well. To resize some kind of user interface element, you click on the last object up or the last button up here, looks like a rectangle. And I can just increase the size of this text object. And so I'll give it a much bigger rectangle. I'm going to increase the font size, maybe size 64. If you can't see the font, go ahead and make it bigger. All right, I'm going to slide it over here. I'm going to change the text. It's usually going to say something like starfish left. I'm typing in some sample text so I know that the text box is large enough to contain it. Um, while you're here, other things you can change. I can change the color. Maybe I'll change the color to a blue. I'm clicking on that. fits with the theme of the game. Now if I if I zoom out, I see that this is taking up a much larger percentage of the screen canvas. And sure enough, when I play the game, it looks a lot better too. All right, now I need to actually set this text. And we'll have this be handled by the controller script that we wrote earlier. So let's go ahead and go back into Turtle Controller. Um, first thing we need to do, we need some new import statements. So I'm going to be using, and these are different classes which contain some of the different methods and functions we've had. I'm going to say using Unity Engine dot UI. 
It's grayed out because I'm not actually using anything from it yet. All right, so I'm going to store a few different inter, uh, integers here. One of them is going to be, let's see, public uh, text object called starfish text. And I also need to store how many there are. So I'm going to do that in a private int. Private because this is something which the user doesn't need access to. The private, let's say, int starfish total. All right. So I'm going to set this value when the game first starts. So I'm going to do that in the start method. And then I'm going to adjust the text that is displayed depending on however many starfish are left. All right. So first, this is a bit of programming to determine how many starfish are on the screen initially. Um, to do that, I'm going to set up in the start method an array of game objects. I'll call it starfish array. I don't need this long term, so it's a local declaration. I'm just setting up an array to determine how many there are. Um, the game object class has a static method, find game objects with tag. I love autocomplete. Then I'm going to check for everything with a tag star. Right, so this will look for everything in the game, tagged as a star, stores them in an array. The only reason I care about this is to get the length of the array, and that's the value of starfish total at the start of the game. So starfish total is equal to starfish array dot length. And once I know the honest goodness total, I can change the text in starfish text. So starfish text dot text is equal to starfish left in quotes plus the total number of starfish in the game. All right, so that'll display the honest to goodness number of starfish left in our game. Now, naturally, we want to adjust this every time we collect a starfish. So once we're done with this line of text, We'll go ahead and scroll down to the onCollision method. Right, whenever you collide with a starfish, well, we should make some adjustment to that variable. Um, starfish total minus equals 1, subtract 1 from starfish, and then change the starfish left text. Starfish text dot text is equal to starfish left. I could have just copied and pasted this from above. Starfish total. Cool. So now, every time we collide, we're going to adjust the total and redisplay it in the user interface. Go ahead and save your code. Head back to Unity. And before we actually do this, though, let me click on Turtle. Now remember, Turtle has the script. Turtle controls that. Um, notice that here, next to starfish text, I haven't actually assigned the specific object yet, which is containing the text. Remember in the code we defined another public variable, but we did not initialize that. Right, so I need to initialize it to the text object, which displays the information. The easiest way to do that is to click on my text object. Ah, I thought I renamed this. I'm going to rename this as score text. What I'm going to do is take score text, click on my turtle, and I'm going to drag score text over to where it says starfish text. Right now, so that variable in the code now references this object on the UI. Go ahead and save your project. Let's give it a run. Right now it says starfish left four, and there are in fact four. And when I collide with one, it goes down to three, two, one and zero. All right. Good job, starfish. Or good job, turtle. All right. The next thing is, I'd like to have some message that indicates the game is over. A you win style message. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to right click. I'm going to go ahead and create another text object. I don't want this to be uh, contained within the stored score text. All right, I'll call this uh, win text. If 
click on win text double click on that um, notice it's got all those default settings which I definitely want to change let me take a look at the canvas zoom in a little bit alright I'd like to make this a lot bigger I'd like it to have the message you win displayed in it you win I'm gonna change the font and I can drag and drop my font file on top here make the message enormous even bigger even bigger it's exciting that you win so we should make it big alright and I'll change it again I'll change the color to be a nice shade of blue once more alright so this will have the message you win centered on the screen now, how do we activate and deactivate this message? Well, there's lots of ways you could do it, but what I'm going to do is go back to my code. All right, when the game starts, the winning text should not be visible, and then, once I win the game, I'd like it to display the message. So first, I'll set up uh, another public text object called win text. And then, when the game starts, um, let's do this in a simple way. Rather than changing the visibility, I'll just set the text to be empty. And so it's on screen, but it doesn't say anything. And later on, I'll check to see if the number of starfish left is zero, in which case I will set the text to say, you win. And so scrolling down to the on collision method, right, every time there's a star, Collision. I adjust that. I'll add a nested if condition. If the starfish total is now equal to zero, the win text should be set to say you win. Oh, win text dot text. There we go. Go ahead and save. And let's try this out. Nope, that didn't work at all. This still says you win. Oh, the reason it still says you win. Click on turtle. I haven't actually assigned the win text yet, so it didn't know what to erase. Let's go ahead and click on your turtle, and then I need to drag win text over to here to actually assign this object. Now, it's not enough to actually give it the same name in the hierarchy in the code. All right, so now all of those are set. Now I'll play. Notice that's gone. I'll go ahead and exhibit my killer starfish collecting skills. I am a winner. Excellent. Happy turtle dance. All right, that's looking pretty good. Um, we could add a few more touches to this as well, just for kind of nice polish to add to the game. For instance, um, let's see. Let's add a skybox next, I think. That's kind of a nice touch. By default, you've got this uh, sky-like color. It's kind of a blue when you see the horizon, but I'd really like to make it more cloud-like. So adding a skybox isn't too bad. First, you have to find some skybox images. It's just a set of images which look like the sides of a sky rendered onto a cube. Again, you can do a Google image search, if you just look up skybox, that's absolutely not it. Skybox one word in a Google image search, and you can find all sorts of different things, right? And they're broken up into different pieces. So you can go ahead and download this anywhere you like. And once you find the set of six images which represent the sky, I'll show you how to set them up. All right, so going back to my game. So I have a set of images, which will work pretty nicely already downloaded. Just a set of uh, six images right here. I'm going to go ahead and import them all into Unity. Remember, all I need to do is click and drag. So I'll grab these six, put them in Unity. Hold on, says Unity. All right, I need to make a new material which incorporates these. So I'm going to right click, create a material. 
I'll call it uh, mat underscore skybox. Uh, to set up a skybox, right, um, you might notice oh, there's only one place to drop an image. What I need to do is change the type of shader. Shader refers to how the graphics are displayed on the screen. So I'm going to change the shader from standard, see where it says skybox, go down that list to six sided. And suddenly we've got six places to drop images. So what I'm going to do is click and drag each one of these into the correct location. So skybox back, skybox down, skybox front. Notice I'm getting kind of a preview down here. That's kind of neat. Uh, skybox left, skybox right, skybox up. Right, and if you've added these in the right arrangement, hey, they should look great. Right, you should actually see a nice sky-like image right here. And if something looks wrong, you can just click and drag on top of one of these to reassign something else. Skybox back. All right. Uh, once that's set up, in order to actually now apply this skybox material to your scene, you're going to go ahead and go to Window. And underneath Window, where it says Lighting, Environment Lighting, it has a setting for skybox. The default skybox is kind of that gradient color right there. I'd like to click and drag Material Skybox on top of that, where it says Default. That just looks super cool. And go ahead and close that window. All right. Um, one thing now, I, I really want to make this ocean look like it's going to the horizon, so maybe I'll change the scale to 1,000 by 1,000. And so it looks like it's going all the way to the horizon. And I'll change the water material, not water texture, but water material, to tile maybe 100 times in each direction. Cool. And so now I can see ocean as far as the eye can see. Um, one very subtle thing, which sometimes happens with the skyboxes, not sure if you'll be able to see it on the video resolution, there's kind of a line or a seam in the skybox. We want to fix that. We want to remove that seam-like line. That comes from the way that textures are imported when you drag them into Unity. So by default, all textures are kind of set to repeat, which makes it easy to test late in an image, like, for instance, like we did with the water. We wanted the water to repeat. But skybox images should not repeat by default. So I'm going to select all the skybox textures, click on the first one, hold down Shift, click on the last one, and then in the inspector, since they're all selected, I can change the properties of all the textures at once, change the wrap mode from repeat to clamp. Sometimes if you uh, click over in the Unity window, it'll say, they're unapplied. Well, I really do want to apply them. Hold on. Great. And so that little image of that little line should be gone. Now if you play your game again, it just looks a little bit cooler, right? a little bit of detail. It's a very bright horizon. All right, we've got a happy little turtle. Um, one thing which is missing is audio. So let's add a little bit of audio. Adding audio to a game is delightfully easy. So for instance, first I'll add some background music. Again, there's lots of great places you can download music if you like. Um, the website in competech.com this is a great website for background music. Um, if you're looking for more of sound effects, freesound.org is pretty good. Just Google in general. You can find whatever you like. So I've got two different sounds I'd like to play. One of them's a background music. One of them's a kind of a little, like a little water drop. Like I, I can't make the sound. But these two sounds I'd like to import into assets. So as usual, you just click and drag. These will get imported for you. So click and drag, you'll see a picture of the waveform. And in order to play music, it's actually pretty straightforward, which is really, really nice. So for instance, to uh, play background music, the easiest way to set this up is to actually take your background music, in this case, ocean waves, for me, and I'm going to drag it onto the main camera. 
the main camera has got a lot of stuff attached to it which makes uh, settings very easy. So once you click and drag something onto the main camera, if you check out the inspector, there's all sorts of extra things that are here now. An audio listener is created for you, and an audio source, which stores the music file which is playing. So as soon as the camera activates, see how it says play on awake? As soon as the camera activates, we'll actually start to hear this sound. Well, this is more of the sound of ocean waves rather than music per se, but it gives it some kind of ambiance. So if I play, I don't know if you can hear that, but it sounds very soothing and relaxing. All right. Um, finally, I've got a sound effect that I'd like to play every time the turtle collects one of the objects. All right, it's good to give user feedback, so this will be kind of a little indicator. Once again, I'm going to go over to the turtle controller object. Right, this is going to be where all the code is written. Uh, the first thing I actually need to do is for the turtle, I need to add something which plays the sound. For a main camera, that was set up for us right away, but I actually need to set this up for the turtle. So click on turtle, and in the inspector, go down to add component. Um, this is an audio component. I want to add, let's see, this is going to be an audio source. It's kind of like a player. And this will play something for us. Right, I'm going to go over now back to my code. Let's so click on my turtle controller code. And add a couple of lines here. I'm going to add, let's see, a public audio clip. Right, this stores the sound effect that I want to play. I'll call it collect sound. And it's public, so I'll be able to set this by clicking and dragging in the Unity editor. And then, I also need to store a reference to the thing which plays the sound. Um, I'll set that up automatically in the start method, and I'll make it private. Uh, private audio source. I'll call it audio player. So I think of it as a player rather than anything else. Alright, in order to set the value of audio player, I'm going to go to my start method. So I need to set this once at the beginning. So audio player, well, what I'm going to do is say this dot get component, and I'm going to insert the type of the component I'm looking for. Let's so get component audio source. It's a method, so I also need the parentheses at the end. All right, so the audio player, this object will look for any attached audio source component and assign it to this variable. And that's great because I need this to be stored as a variable to do it later on. All right, so I'm going to activate the audio player. Later on, when I collide with a starfish, if I get a starfish, I'll put this code right up here. So audio player. Um, I want it to play the audio clip. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, I'd like to, potentially, the, your audio player might be playing more than one sound effect at a time. So there's a method called play one shot, which will play it. And this is going to play the collect sound. This way I can use the audio player to potentially play more than one sound. All right, so that, that should play the sound every time an object is collected. So I'll go ahead and save and give this a test. Oh, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work because I have not yet assigned the collect sound yet. Remember, it's a public variable which was not initialized. Go ahead to turtle, and then drag the water drop sound effect next to collect sound in the inspector. All right, now go ahead and play. I should hear a little of a sound. It's a little bit overpowered by the background music, the background sound effect. I can adjust that. So, for instance, clicking on main camera, audio source, I can actually change the volume. So, that's how you set up the sound effects. Kind of very basic stuff, but hey, this is a pretty good game for your very first Unity game. We've learned about all sorts of things. We've learned about importing textures, creating materials and meshes. 
going to go ahead and sort these things. I'm putting all my textures into one folder. Looks a lot better. We're organizing up our project before we're done. I have an audio folder where I'll put these. And we've set up some prefabs, we've written some code, we've got a lot of nice little effects, we've got sound in a skybox, so this looks great. Uh, thank you for joining me, and good luck with all your future Unity projects.